Very good. I'm going to call to order a city council meeting. <coughs> Madam Clerk. Thank you, Your Worship. First item are minutes of the regular council meeting held Monday, March 10th. The recommendations that council approve those minutes. Second. Moved by Councilor Asmussen, second by Councilor Sikora. All in favor? Opposed? Carried unanimously. Item two are minutes of the Multiculturalism Advisory Committee meeting held Wednesday, February 19th. The recommendation is that those minutes be received. Moved by Chair, Chair Councilor Asmussen, second by Councilor O'Neill. All in favor? Opposed? Carried unanimously. Item three are minutes of the Sustainability and Environmental Advisory Committee meeting held Wednesday, February 26th. The recommendation is that those minutes be received. Moved by Count Chair Councillor Asmundson, uh, second by Councillor O'Neill. All in favor, opposed, carried unanimously. And there's a recommendation arising out of those minutes, and it's regarding it's that the uh, Council approve the Sustainability Environmental Advisory Committee 2014 work plan. No. Second. Moved by Councillor Nicholson, seconded by Councillor O'Neill. All in favor, opposed, carried unanimously. Item four are minutes of the Universal Accessibility Advisory Committee meeting held Tuesday, March 4th. The recommendation is that Council receive those minutes. Moved by Councillor Sikora, second by Councillor Hodge. All in favor, opposed, carried unanimously. Item five are minutes of the Riverview Lands Advisory Committee meeting held Wednesday, March 5th. The recommendation is that Council receive those minutes. Moved by Councillor Hodge, second by Councillor Nicholson. All in favor, opposed, carried unanimously. Mr. Hodges is the chair there. First recommendation arising out of those minutes is that Council forward to the BC Housing the following recommendations from the Riverview Lands Advisory Committee related to the Riverview Visioning Opening Houses, as shown on the slides. Moved by Councillor Reed, second by Councillor Sikora. All in favor? Opposed? Carried <coughs> unanimously. Second recommendation arising from those minutes relates to the Riverview Building Assessment Reports. The recommendation is that Council forward to BC Housing the following comments from the Riverview Lands Advisory Committee related to the Riverview Building Assessment Reports, as shown on the two slides. Moved by Councillor Hodge, second by Councillor Nicholson. I will say that uh, uh, several of us have already been in touch with the province on these issues. Uh, oops, I see some speakers. Councillor O'Neill. Yeah, I'm just wondering what the... Um Advisory Committee had in mind on the uh, second last bullet that the economic potential of the buildings be included in their assessed value. Um, that strikes me as a rather amorphous concept, um, the way it's worded here. Was there something more concrete that uh, they had in mind that, that they would be able to do here? Councillor Hodge. Sure. Um, we get activate, wait a second, we'll activate his microphone. I'll just give a bit of an overview of, of that meeting and, and the discussion that took place around the, the building assessment um, report. Um, the committee uh, raised a number of issues at the meeting. Um, first issue was that only 43 of the 90 or so buildings were evaluated and that the assessment um, is actually a financial rating uh, based on uh, the anticipated repair costs versus the, the building value. And, and this caused several concerns for the committee. Um, they thought that the report authors um, used a very narrow criteria when making the evaluation. Um, on the value side of the assessment, it didn't take into account the, the heritage value of the buildings or its potential use or its, uh, the potential to, uh, to create uh, offsetting revenue. And thus, in some cases, they believe that the, uh, the buildings uh, may be actually rated too low in the terms of their value. Um, conversely, on the expense side, uh, the committee felt that in many cases the expenses were too high due to a variety of factors, such as uh, the buildings being upgraded to a standard uh, higher than required for its current use, um, new building code in some cases, the um, requirements uh, weren't correctly applied, um, and expenses factored in for repairs, uh, some of the repairs may not be needed for, for 20 years. So um, what concerned them was that because it's a cost ratio, um, that the value of the buildings themselves are underrated, and in some cases the cost of the repairs are overrated. And, and, the, and this comes into play because They've used a, a BC Housing has used a rating system, whereas if 5% of the value of the building 
is required for repairs or less, the building is rated good. If 6 to 10 percent is used, the building is rated fair. If 11 to 30 percent of the cost of the building is required for repairs, it's rated poor. And if the value of the building, if it costs more than 30 percent of that value to fix the building, the building is rated as critical. And, and one of the challenges is the, that they have is that, that uh, A, these thresholds are set very low. But also, uh, in fact, they're set so low that I just about every building on the site that was rated ended up being rated as critical. Um, and, and there was also concern that the terms that they use, good, fair, poor, and critical, suggest building condition more than financial ratio. And the term critical suggests the building should be condemned, when in actual fact, many of the buildings rated critical are still currently in use or were used up until two years ago. So there was some concern about the mythology that was used, the terminology, and, and how the values of the repairs versus the value of the building were done. And that's sort of what they want us to express to, uh, to BC Housing. Oops, back to Councillor O'Neill. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, great, uh, great work by the committee then on really engaging this issue and a good report to Council on these things. Um, Councillor Hodge and I had talked about um, how to better utilize, how to best utilize the, the, the advisory committee and the, it's advising council and council is taking that advice and that's, that's a good work, thank you. Yeah, as a further explanation of if you take component by component for that matter, you'd end up with, for example, a brand new roof being rated critical um, in terms of the cost of repairing it because the cost of repairing it uh, for a brand new roof is estimated to be exactly the cost that they just incurred to install it. Uh, but not to be paid out until 30 years from now when the roof has ended its life. So it's a, an absolutely ridiculous um, method of valuation. It made absolutely no sense. And Good. as a result, we ended up with some skewed results that uh, we need to get corrected. Thank you. I'm going to go to Councillor Sikora. Thank you very much. I was exactly going to mention the same thing as you did, Mayor, as far as the roof is, is concerned. It's only two years old, isn't it? Uh, the, there's one of the one of the roofs that's two years. Several yeah, of the roofs. I, I'd years. hope that we have this BC housing before us at the next council meeting, so we can tell them that you know what the report that they have and the study that they have is is worthless because that's what it is. It's full of holes, so you know that it's it's worthless. So I think that uh, my. Uh, asking for too much to bring them down to the bring them to the next council meeting and tell them about what we think of their report I, I suspect <laughs> that what uh, we, we can't actually compel them to attend but we have we have indicated not so much that the report is useless but that it does need modification I did in fact speak with uh, Shane Ramsey who is the CEO of BC housing and he and I and he said okay um, there is no motive here what do you need and I said you've got to convert it to a preliminary report and let's start to refine it because there is some valid data in it unfortunately there's a whole bunch of other stuff and the the other stuff really make it so that the result the um, the reliability of the report is is called into question and as a result as well some people are now questioning the motives I don't think there were any uh, askew motives I think we just ended up with a somewhat um, hastily produced and perhaps even casually produced uh, I'd report. Like to, I'd like to demolish that, everything in there. Well, actually, one of the best, uh, <laughs> there were two buildings that didn't make the critical list um, as far as one of them, um, one of the, and therefore one of the best rated buildings is the one that's about to collapse. <laughs> West Lawn. So um, it's, it, it's, it's true. And they, and they recognize it's, it's a little bit, uh, they, they recognize that there were some mistakes made and they're going to, we're going to have to, so they've relabeled it, I think, uh, preliminary, and now we'll, we'll see where we go from here to try to make the report more representative, and I think these recommendations do that, make it more representative of the information we need to move forward, and that's what we're all trying to do. Okay. Are we good with that? Okay. The recommendation has been moved and seconded. All in favor? Opposed? Carried unanimously. Item 6 are minutes of the Maillardville Commercial and Cultural Revitalization Advisory Committee held Thursday, March 6. The recommendation is that Council receive those minutes. Moved by Chair Councillor Hodge and seconded by Councillor Nicholson. All in favor? Opposed? Carried unanimously. Moving on to the items from this 
this evening's public hearing. Item 7 relates to City of Coquitlam Zoning Amendment Bylaw Number 4475-2014. The recommendation is that Council give second, third, and fourth and final readings to Zoning Amendment Bylaw Number 4475-2014. Moved by Councillor Asmundson, seconded by Councillor Score. All in favor? Opposed? Carried unanimously. Item 8, City of Coquitlam Zoning Amendment Bylaw Number 4468-2014, a text amendment to increase parking requirements for child care facilities. The recommendation is that Council give second, third, and fourth and final readings to Zoning Amendment Bylaw Number 4468-2014. Moved by Councillor Asmundson. <coughs> Seconded by Councillor Zarello. Councillor Sikora. Yeah, thank you very much, Mayor. You know, I've got problems with this one. And my problem is this, the fact is that, you know, here, I guess it's a consultant that gave us this report that, uh, and, I, and I don't know why we would have occupied a, or hired a consultant to tell us that they, we need more parking spaces uh, in, a, in a child care facility when this uh, lady that owns two of them said that, uh, that she stands by what she's saying as far as the parking is concerned, that the, she certainly had enough parking. Not only that, that it uh, jeopardizes her uh, business in two places that will be non-conforming if we, if we pass this bala. And I would suggest that we table this and deal with the people that do have uh, these facilities and come up with something that may be uh, good for all the facilities because I'd hate to think that you know what as a result of some consultant that put a report together to our to our staff that somehow we live by it and, and we'll die by it that it's a, the, the way to go and no other way to go I, I think that I have that problem but I don't know to the planner what is their alternative I think we've got one. mr. McIntyre your Worship, um, thank you. Uh, just, just to clarify, no, no, it wasn't the consultant that, that provided this advice or this recommendation. This was something that you know, staff did. But what we we're drawing on is that with the um, the recent uh, daycare applications we've been seeing going forward, where we've had the traffic consultant, the applicant had a traffic consultant do an analysis. They were coming back with these sort of recommendations, so we we felt we were within range. But, but certainly, if it's uh, uh, council's. Uh, uh, wish for staff to go back and rethink this and maybe we, we look at what we have currently with some of the, the current uh, operations and see how they're functioning if there are some issues uh, with that we, we could then report back to, to council with some other ideas yeah, thank you uh, to that effect I'm, I'm gonna listen to the rest of the council members but I certainly will not be supporting this uh, this amendment uh, I, do I to, uh, hope to hear from some of the council members first thank you okay Councillor, I bet you will, because they're all going to speak here. Councillor Zrillo. Um, this one kind of reminded me a little bit of our, um, our, our bylaw that we did about the um, openings and the patios. This one kind of reminded me of it. So uh, I don't believe there's a flat formula that's going to work for every single daycare, and I think we're going to end up with the same problem that we had with our patios, where we're going to keep people coming forward and asking for exemptions. I personally believe that uh, the current bylaw suffices because one of the things that came up was what kind of complaints are we getting and we haven't really gotten a lot. Um, so I, I, I'm totally fine with the current bylaw and, and think that we should consider on a permit by permit basis for the daycares that will come up. I'm totally fine with the bylaw as is. Thank you. Councillor Hodge. Uh, what troubles me is, uh, well, first, you know, when we talk that the next one may be on Burke Mountain, and we know that that's, uh, we've got parking issues up there right now, if that's in fact where the next one may, may come forward. Uh, but regardless of where they may be, um, my concern is that when you get to these large daycares uh, where you've got 70 kids, which translates, I think she said, 11 employees, so she needs one spot per employee, so she's up to 11 spots, and then the ratio of one per, se one per 10, and I guess she's at 74 or something, so she ends up having to put in eight. We suddenly now have 19 spots in, uh, in one, you know, that's, that's a lot of blacktop. And, and I'd, I'd, I'd be feel comfortable with, I, I agree with the employees got to park uh, off street. I am uncomfortable when a proponent says, Ellen, I'm just gonna put some orange cones out on the street 
to create her own loading zone. That doesn't work for me either. But something in between where you sort of say, you know, one spot per 10 st students, but maybe as soon as you get to 30 or 40, you, then you sort of say, well, four is all you need because I don't see that eight cars are going to come and go at the same time and that you're going to need eight drop-off spots. So I think when you get to a certain size, you can sort of say the, the economy of scale and the fact that people are coming and going that maybe that uh, what we need to do is putting them uh, put a max of, you know one per employee and then one per student up to a max of three drop off spots or, or something I do believe we have to have dropping off spots we can't rely on you know doing it on the curb but I, I think that and the numbers here seem excessive to me in terms of the amount of parking thank you Councillor Wilson I just think that uh, child care is so expensive uh, that we need to do whatever we can to keep the costs uh, as low as possible and I think that these uh, recommendations maybe were a little excessive and it's worth having a second look. Councillor O'Neill. Yeah, um, uh, continuing on that line of uh, thinking, um, if, if we enact this, I believe it will be the death knell for community-based daycare. You'll be seeing the daycare and mega facilities in plazas and things like that. Um, uh, to have such onerous restrictions I, th I think will kill um, community, any new community based daycare. So it'll be in shopping plazas, um, corners of shopping centers, things like that. Uh, they won't be in the community. Um, I was uh, I, very impressed with the presentation made by the uh, with Carol Weens of Bright Star Children Academy. Um, I thought she made a great many good points. Uh, the presentation from staff uh, cited the, uh, the municipal scan that we did, uh, table one, page two of, of the report that I have in front of me here. Um, and the statement was made that uh, of Burnaby and Richmond, these seem to be most accurately reflecting the demand for parking. Um, those, Burnaby and Richmond, had the the steepest requirements, but we're going, uh, the proposed um, bylaw that we have before us is going even beyond that. So um, normally when we do a municipal scan, we sort of look at, well, what's kind of the average? We'll put ourselves in the middle there somewhere. No, here we look to see uh, Burnley and Richmond, they had uh, pretty steep requirements and uh, uh, this bylaw would, would have us uh, make them even steeper. Um, so I will not be supporting this bylaw going any further forward. Thank you. Councillor Rasmussen. Uh, thank you very much. Just through to staff, and I just want to get a sense. We had the um, large daycare development up at um, Kingston and Princeton. Do you recall the, uh, I thought they had about 19 spots in that one that they, they put into that development. And I think there was concerns when we had that development passed about the need for parking on site in that area. Do you recall? No, unfortunately, I don't recall off the top of my head, but I do do remember that part of uh, what the transportation consultant analysis did conclude was there was some assumption that uh, drop-off uh, would be accommodated, some of it would be accommodated on the street. Okay. Um, this area where we're talking, where she's talking is, is on Burke Mountain. I live close to the area. It's a become a densified area. Um, parking's a premium on the street now and when the daycare is going to operate between those times people will be leaving but there's still going to be a lot of on-street parking during the daytime. Um, I think as Councillor Hodge said I think the number is right for the employees on site. Um, I'm not sure if we need four or five spots for drop-off. That would still leave us at 15 or 16 so so but I do think that's where we have to look at these large um, 70 75 children daycares there that's a lot of kids in a, in a daycare center in a building in an area so um, I don't mind this going back but I, I don't think it's too far off what we require when we're having these large daycares here in a in, in a neighborhood and this is a, a drive to area. If you're looking at Burnaby and some other areas where they may have sky trains or different transportation mode to get them to or better bus service. But in this area, 
people are all going to drive their kids there. Thank you. Thank you. Councilman Nicholson. Thank you. <clears throat> I'm, like Councilor Zarillo, I think this is not going to be a one-size-fits-all solution. The only areas that I know of where, we have, where I have seen complaints revolve around home-based daycare, and I think we need to address that situation. I think the requirements for parking off-street need to be determined what's appropriate for those situations, because one of the thrusts of our allowing home-based business is that it not disrupt neighborhoods. That's what we hear it happens occasionally, and I think we need to set standards that will preclude that. But I've heard no complaints about the larger community-based daycares. It seems to work. So I think I'm, I'm not determined that this needs to come back. But if it does, I'd certainly like to see it addressed in a stratified kind of way. Thank you. I'm in the same boat. Um, oops, sorry, Councillor Reed's added, but uh, I'm in the same boat. I think up to 40 uh, kids, you're probably dealing with the right ratio here. And after 40, I'd want both those ratios cut in half. Um, so that, uh, so a full space for each of the first five staff and a half space for the next first staff above five. Um, one parking space for, for 10 children up to 40 and one parking space for 20 children uh, from 40 upward, so that that kind of um, tapering off because we where I think we do end up with a um, a potentially onerous. I don't think it's quite as onerous as Councillor O'Neill suggests the death knell of, um, <laughs> but it is it is onerous. I think it's it would ca cause the illness of uh, some of the uh, potential daycares, and I I think so. I'm going to suggest perhaps that we may want to refer this back to staff uh, uh, for um, some tweaking and see if there's a, a solution that can come out of that process that can get garner uh, four readings that would still be consistent with the public hearing we held tonight. Not uh, sure. And I've got Councillor Reed. Thank you. Um, I would like to see it just a specific number of parking spots, so I'd like to, to see three or four parking spots at the very most, depending on the size of the daycare. I do want to retain the one spot per employee, though, So, uh, but I don't think it needs to be eight spots. I think it could be three or four just so that there are spots, so that the little darlings aren't running across the street into the daycare. That's the thing that I'm always afraid of. So I don't think we can move that tonight, but send it back to staff and, yeah. I'll make a motion you don't refer it back to staff. Second. Moved by Councillor uh, Sikora, second by Councillor Asmundson. They were always in agreement. Back to staff. To refer it back to staff. Yeah. All in favor? Opposed? Good enough. Carried unanimous. Okay. You're opposed. Okay. Sorry, carried almost unanimously. Councillor Zarillo was opposed. It was close. Very close. <laughs> yeah, usually eight to one is our version of unanimous, isn't it? We agree, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Item nine is City of Coquitlam Zoning Amendment Bylaw number 4470 related to a text amendment to exempt screening for antennas and mechanical equipment from building and structure height limits. Recommendations that Council give second, third, and fourth and final readings to Zoning Amendment Bylaw number 4470-2014. Moved by Councillor Hodge, seconded by Councillor... <laughs> Sorry, it wasn't okay. <laughs> yeah, but you were facing the other dragon. Moved by Councillor Nicholson, seconded by Councillor O'Neill. All in favor? Opposed? <laughs> Carried unanimously. Oops. Are you, Councillor Reed, you, you weren't on that item. No. Okay. I'm sorry. No worries. Item 10, Zoning Amendment Bylaw Number 4464-2014, a text amendment to remove reference to marijuana medical access regulations. The recommendation is that Council give second, third, and fourth and final readings to Zoning Amendment Bylaw Number 4464-2014. Moved. Moved by Councillor Asmussen, seconded by Councillor Hodge. All in favor? Opposed? Carried unanimously. 
Item 11, City of Coquitlam Citywide Official Community Plan Amendment Bylaw Number 4465, 2014, Mayardville Neighborhood Plan. <laughs> Recommendation is that Council give second, third, and fourth and final readings to Citywide Official Community Plan Amendment Bylaw Number 4465, 2014. Moved by Councillor Hodge, second by Councillor Nicholson. All in favor? All opposed? Ça se passe. Et je veux remercier uh, tout, tout les, everybody in the planning department. I want to thank them for their work. There's a, an awful body of work, an awfully large body of work here, and uh, well done. I think someone, um, someone in the audience mentioned that uh, she'd become a mother twice during the production of this report. <laughs> Item 12, Zoning Amendment Bylaw Number 4469-2014. Incidental too, sorry. <laughs> 520 Como Lake Avenue. Recommendation is that Council give second and third readings to Zoning Amendment Bylaw Number 4469-2014. So moved. Second. Moved by Councillor uh, O'Neill, seconded by Councillor Hodge. Councillor O'Neill. Yes. Um, well, where to start here? Uh, first off, I, I really would like to congratulate everybody who took part in this process that's been going on for so long. Um, um, I've been exceptionally impressed with uh, the way BD engaged the, uh, the community. I've been exceptionally impressed with the way the community has engaged council um, and, um, and ensured that uh, we saw their point of view. Um, and um, I've carefully considered all of the different uh, points of view and the issues and, and, and what's best for Coquitlam. Um, uh, very moved by some of the testimony from uh, supporters of the why. Um, a point that I want to make on that is that we talked quite a bit about the seven townhomes that will be um, part of this parcel, uh, part of this development and how that will be affordable housing. In a very real and significant way, the 180 uh, units in this tower will be affordable housing too, will add to the affordability um, pool in Coquitlam, in the lower mainland. Um, the fewer homes that we build, the more expensive the homes get everywhere in Metro Vancouver. Um, the number one way that we can make homes more affordable for young men and women, young families starting out, is to provide the supply. and. Uh, this is supply that will be provided, I think, in, 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 in almost an ideal place. Um, I think it's very noteworthy uh, that this does not actually require an official community plan amendment, um, just a zoning amendment. Um, there was a lot of talk about the TDS tonight, um, and I remember when council unanimously passed the TDS in July of, what was it, 2012. Um, that the, the thought was that, you know, this is going to be used when we have to, uh, we knew the push was going to kind of come to shove when it was, when there was a big OCP amendment to make. And we're going to have to use this uh, TDS in place of the, you know, uh, neighborhood plan updates or things like that. And while we don't really need to use the TDS, uh, because the official community plan already allows this sort of thing. Um, it's an important land use issue. I think it, it goes along with um, with the council's vision um, that the, that we've been proceeding with, um, carefully considered uh, density, um, well built buildings, um, with excruciating care to the detail um, of um, of making sure that amenities are in place, make, and sort of as was pointed out, the community many contribution program. Um, will we'll, we'll flow, uh, we'll flow from this. Um, there's definitely, there are definitely plans in place to provide more community amenities in Berquitlam, um, and this, this project will, will help uh, fund that. We are not approving this. I am not anyway, because it means more money for Coquitlam. You know, we're going to get all of this cash, this, that, and that. That's not the primary reason that we, um, th that I, look at something like this. I look at something like this and say, I support this because A, it is good land use, and B, it's a good project, and C, it's going to serve the interests of a lot of people. Um, 
There was a, a little um, blog item that was written today on a local blog talking about how, you know, why is it that everybody who always wants to be the last people moving into their community and then they want to stop things from coming and, and that, that, is a, that is a situation that, that uh, on council we, we, we come up with, uh, come up against all the time that, um, that sure, yeah, I've got my high rise, now I don't want any more high rises. There are some issues that I understand and, 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 and I hope that uh, bef at development permit time that we can and look at uh, the issues regarding some privacy um, uh, and maybe there's some more we can do with the lane. Those are sorts of things that yes, there's legitimate issues. Um, we should do everything we can to make sure we've got the very best solution. Um, just want to um, conclude by talking about change. Um, a lot of different expressions about change. Um, the funniest one I came across is that change is inev inevitable, except when it's dealing with a vending machine. Um, so we don't always get our change from that. But the one I think I'd like to, to leave with, with everybody tonight is that change, a quote that says, change always comes bearing gifts. And, and I, I really do believe that there are a lot of opportunities here, that there are concerns that have been expressed, but in the long run, people will look at this, and even the people who have concerns about it today are going to see that this is good for the community, good for the neighborhood, good for Coquitlam. Thank you. The only other thing that doesn't change is the level of your humor. Councillor Sikora. I mean, it's high. It's a high level. Councillor Sikora. Thank you very much. You know, the, the one thing that, you know, here's a situation that, you know, there there comes out a little crumb to the taxpayers of this community that somehow seven units of social housing, so therefore we're going to build the, to the sky. You know, that's a crumb. That's all it is. And what we're doing is make some apples and oranges. That's what we're doing. You know, I mean, yeah, look, if, 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 and, and yeah, you know, to have the single women with children need the homes, no question about it, and I'm all for it. Give me a plan in that area for a five-story building for single women with children, and I'd, and I'd vote for it and a beat. But all this is, is a little crumb that, that we, you know, why didn't I, why C, why MCA build a, a more units on the one that we gave them at 520, 528 Como Lake? They could have built another two or three stories. They could have built a lot more space. But now we're selling the, our space from our place, from city land, to accommodate this 26-story animal. Now, you know, we don't have a community plan map in place. The TDS has been approved, there's no question about it. Community plan map, maybe we're going by the old community plan map, it's 14 years old. Every five years, every city visits their community plan map for many reasons, because things do change. There's no question about it, things do change. So, you know, uh, to, you know, and, and the one, the one thing, Mr. Beatty is a very, very good developer, no question. Uh, Keith Beatty, the founder of the company, I've known him for many, many years. A real good man, there's no question about it. However, we've now, uh, they seem to draw a, a lot of attention to wherever they develop. Number one, Austin Blue Mountain. That one drew about 200 people to the public hearing. Okay, this one here, then draw another big crowd that was standing room outside only. And I'm saying, when is this going to stop? And is there any other developer that fills the council chambers? No, there isn't. Tells me only one thing. We're trying to cram high buildings and space that is not, cannot accommodate it properly. Not only that, the roads will not accommodate it. We got two lanes, and I'm saying two lanes, 
because that's what it is. There's that one by the animal hospital. It's a lane. There's no two cars can pass each other. And there's a lane next to the pub that goes around towards the Farrow Street. Can the fire truck get through there? No, they couldn't. No way. Two cars could not pass it. And, you know, so what we're doing here is, you know, make me feel bad because the single women with children will not have a place to live. Build a five-story place on there, and, I'll, and I can tell you, openly, publicly, I'll say that I would support and beat for 60 or 70 units in there, a four-story job for that facility. But it's, you know, and I know that the planning department is trying to accommodate everybody that wants to build. And sometimes we go a little overboard because the council wants it to happen, so we go a little overboard. But I tell you something, until the committee to, right now I'd like to see this whole thing stop, and until the community plan map is in place, totally, and presented to the residents of that area, and that the residents in that area buy it or not buy it, and then come back to council and we can move ahead. <coughs> What we have here, we'll put the cart before the horse. And it's the worst thing that we can do. And uh, I think that we're doing a great injustice to the residents in that area. Great injustice to the uh, residents in that area because we want development in this community. You know, and the parking, sure, the Bala, they followed the Bala parking, 1.35. To me, I was opposed to it from day one, that parking Bala, because we had a study by the previous engineer that said, oh, there's all kinds of spaces that are empty in the high rises and everything else. Why? There's absentee owners that own a whole bunch of units and there's no cars in their parking spot. I live in a place where it's 55 and over, living there, there's 190 units, and there's like 1.75 is the parking ratio, and every parking spot is full. Seniors need independence also. They want to have their car, they may want to use their car. I'm not gonna force them to start getting a bus ticket or going on buses because to, for them to get to place one on one, they want to be independent. So, you know, I see nothing wrong with that. But for me to give this second, third reading, and hopefully that some magic is going to happen between third and fourth reading, I can't do it. Because I'd, 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 I'd base myself as a hypocrite. Okay? And I'm not going to lower myself to that standard. Okay? I've always been up front with the taxpayers for 42 years. As I sat here for 42 years, I've always been up front with the taxpayers, and I'll never let them down. I'll still be up front with the taxpayers. Thank you very much. I will not support it. Yep. I'll be supporting this moving forward. I'll be supporting this moving forward. Uh, this is uh, the rezoning of this. Should this uh, should this site be a high uh, a high rise site? And I, I I don't think anyone was speaking of it not being a high rise site. It's uh, the question before us right now is the zoning. Um, there are some questions still on the others on a whole bunch of aspects of the development. The, one of the big ones for me is the the lane. I think the lane will accommodate the final lane configuration will accommodate the uh, traffic perfectly well. The challenge will be in the interim, and I think we have work to do to try to work out how that functions in the interim. There was a suggestion perhaps running it in the other direction. I don't, um, I'm not going to, you know, try and get us to make decisions like that uh, tonight, but that's not tonight anyway. Tonight is not the development permit. Tonight is whether or not this is a, a high rise site. I supported a five story, a four story uh, wood frame building for uh, single parents. Um, in this neighborhood. Uh, some council members didn't, but I did because I believe that was a good land use. It required, though, millions of dollars in senior government funding in order to make it happen. And it required us to fund it as well. We, we the city, had to give up the land value, the entire parcel of land next door, um, in order to make that work. 
we can't, it's not exactly a sustainable model. And so what we have here is one, uh, a seven units of housing that doesn't cost the taxpayer anything. Uh, and I think that's a, that's a real win-win. I think it's, it's a model for how we can move forward as well um, throughout the, the city in trying to identify win-win opportunities for affordable housing um, within our community and spaced out within our community. It doesn't have to be that's the affordable housing building. It can be, as this is going to be, um, mixed in with other developments. And I absolutely think the, the YWCA does a wonderful job. There's some talk about perhaps, well, couldn't, couldn't we take all of the value and put it into constructing uh, uh, something bigger than that? Well, the, the economics of this work because we've found a win-win. Um, it won't work if the developer doesn't win as well. I mean, obviously the developer has to get something out of this uh, or else it doesn't, uh, doesn't achieve something. And this particular developer has done great work in our community for decades. Uh, so I don't have any concerns about that. I think what we have to do now is move forward and then uh, I think staff have taken note of some of the concerns we have related to over overlook, uh, we related to the, the two lane, one lane, back lane. Um, and I think that those bits of work still have to be done as we move forward uh, toward a development permit. So I'll be supporting it uh, for second or for second and third uh, and 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 then looking for uh, some additional solutions. And, uh, and I do thank everyone that came out tonight uh, the, to speak for or against it, uh, to speak for the neighborhood that we're trying to achieve here. We want a neighborhood that is supportive of the transit system that we're putting in. It's a billion and a half dollars of, of public transit and it requires density, it re it, but it, that density is, as <coughs> Councillor O'Neill said, uh, with those challenges comes gifts. The gift is the kinds of amenities that this community has been calling for. And I know that the community has made lots of recommendations uh, to council and I know council members have listened to that and have, um, um, it has affected the way in which we've moved forward, including uh, the kinds of amenity decisions that we have to make and the amenity priorities that we're pushing very hard for to finally put amenities in the, the Burquitlam area, the amenities that have been missing from that neighborhood and from other neighborhoods in Coquitlam for the last 40 years. Councillor Zrillo. Thank you. Um, well, this was a really, really difficult uh, one for a, for a newbie, that's for sure. And I did come here tonight to listen to what everybody had to say and to influence my decision. And I have to say what I heard loud and clear was that we need more affordable housing and that the majority of the proponents to this talk tonight about the affordable housing. Um, in regards to the high-rise building, I didn't hear anybody in favor of the high-rise building. So with that in mind, um, what I'm seeing here is potentially um, uncertainty for the residents of this area, not necessarily a strong, a strong plan, and I'm at this point just not comfortable approving a rezoning because perhaps this zoning should be fully affor affordable housing and I know I've heard the arguments that we don't have the money to do that but but if I just think about what I've what I've heard tonight it's this is about affordable housing and yes I understand that we need the tower to subsidize the affordable housing but I heard no one speak in favor of I shouldn't say I heard no one speak in favor. I didn't hear as many people speaking in favor as, of the tower as I did about the affordable housing. So again, not comfortable approving this zoning when, the, when there's no uh, confirmation for our residents that we have a strong vision for this area and that the planning and the infrastructure is in place. Councillor Nicholson. Well, I think we all appreciate everybody who's come out and spoken and envy those who've already gone home. Probably each of them certain of the outcome, no matter which way they were thinking. One good thing about a long, long public hearing is that it gives me lots and lots and lots of time to think. And. Well, I am going to support this moving forward. 
our, our council, we set the Berquitlam neighborhood plan back in 2002. We made changes from time to time in the language of uh, zoning text amendments and density permissions and all that kind of thing. We did all that in the eye of the public. We did it with the best public consultation that we could muster, different from one time to another, but always wanting to make sure that to the best that we could that the public knew where we were headed. No, we didn't do a full tilt revision of the Berquitlam neighborhood plan, and we are going to do it, and it's going to be soon. We did all that. We did it with full public disclosure and knowledge. And then we put it out to investors. And I, I was going to say developers, and I thought, I don't think developers is a dirty word, but some people think so. And we had this weird thing tonight where we had a bunch of people who told us that we don't like the project, but we really love Beatty. Uh, and that's kind of gratifying. But we, we went out and said to people, come and invest. This is a place to come and sp put a bunch of money in. You can get a good project. You can employ a whole lot of people. You can do great things for our community. And we will make sure, to the best of our ability, that they are great things for our community, our whole community. And that's what we asked them to do, and that's what people came and did. Now, I thought about saying, oh, let's amend this back to second, give it second only, because that'll send a real clear message to the, at that point I was thinking developer, that they need to deal with some issues. But they sat here, as many of them as there are of us, and listened as intently as we all have, and I think they know the things that disturb the neighborhood, the things that continue to bother me and my colleagues. Uh, I think Councillor O'Neill was, was on them. I think we all are. Access and privacy. The roadway, the laneway, not just for cars, but for peds and bikes and strollers and wheelchairs. Everybody has to be able to get safely to and from this project. And we need a better solution than the lane that exists. But there's an awful lot of brain power over there and over there and a little bit over here. And I think solutions can be found and they need to be found before we get to the point of fourth and development permit. And similarly, the issues of privacy, whether it's through orientation or whether there are more, better, other creative ways to deal with these things that I don't know about and haven't thought of yet. But I'm looking forward to hearing how those things are dealt with before we bring this to finality. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Reed. Thank you. Well, what astounded me the most this evening was to hear that we had no official community plan. I thought that was quite astounding because, of course, we have an official community plan. What had happened about two years ago, maybe two and a half years ago, is we started seeing with the onset of knowing that the Evergreen Line was actually almost the first shovel in the ground, we started to find out that within the Burquitlam area we were getting a lot of developers coming in and indeed the first one were townhouses and then there was a three-story apartment and I remember talking to folks in the Burquitlam area about this stuff and as it started to get a little frenzied around the Burquitlam Plaza but more to the east and the south of the plaza we had I guess say Mr. Uh, McIntyre probably had six or seven developments take place in that little core there when we decided that we had better pull out the whole evergreen route and take a really good look at it and start taking staff time to sit down and develop the transit orient oriented areas immediately around the sky train, sky train stations city center was an obvious one but the most obvious and most urgent one was Berquitlam because that's one that we wanted to get right. So there was a transit-oriented um, 
development plan done. And it was done with consultation. And to Mr. Violet, I have no idea if you sent 100 in on a page. I never saw them. And that's unusual because usually when staff goes out and they do their community consultations, they bring everything back and we usually get copies and we can read and we can read them. And I honest to gosh didn't see it. But I remember sitting and having many, many discussions on what was the highest and best use, uh, where should we go from here, what's acceptable. And the first and foremost thing in every council member's mind around here is whatever we do, we have to get amenities in for this neighborhood. And along came the why. And they were talking to us about doing a, a, a big community center in Coquitlam. Where would they do it? On Burke Mountain or, or down in the low heat area or in the middle or where would they do it? And they went into great consultation too. And I think sort of the Burquitlam area became their choice and that was great. It's still gonna cost us many, many, many million dollars but at least we could see in the future that we would have something there for the people of Burquitlam. So there was a plan and we followed it and highest and best use won out. This plan that they've done is a bit of an anomaly when they decide that they can sort of contribute to the why by building some affordable housing units and you can't really call those affordable housing because they're they're not, they're, they're basically subsidized housing. But in any event, it's housing sorely for people that need it. I can support this. I think that I know the developer, the architect who stood up here and has said that they had eight iterations of how they could cite it, but citing's for another day and it's not today. This is just zoning. Um, I still have real concerns about the laneway. I, re I really do. And somehow we're going to have to, before fourth reading, solve that. Absolutely. Um, access and egress is, is really, really important here. And I think we have to look forward to the fact that our neighbors, Burnaby, they plop up high rises like planting carrots and they're all over the place. And right now, fortunately, they're very busy in, in um, Brentwood, so hopefully they won't get too busy on, on our border right away. We're going to see lots of development and we're not the only city that's sitting here going through pain. Um, I don't know if you saw the global news the other night, but Langley, Brookswood area, which was one of the first areas ever built in Langley and there are a lot of single family homes and close to the town, the city of Langley town center and now they're going through this whole development and everybody's up in arms because they don't want apartments in, in where they, the single family residents are. And it's hard, it's hard for all of us. Um, we don't choose this. We are forced by the regional growth strategy to take um, our share, apparently, um, of density. And that's what we're trying to do. But as the mayor and I, because we get down there all the time, is we're saying, well, if you want us to take density, give us transportation. And I know you've all seen in the papers and on the television what's happening with that. And just in the last week, the mayors at least have a little more authority where the transportation's concerned, and let's hope we get that. SkyTrain is a huge thing for this community. And sometimes it's a be careful what you wish for, because now we've got the SkyTrain now the land cost is such that the highest and best use is only going to be high rises, and I mean high rises. So here we are. We have a great developer. Uh, we have one that does some innovative designs, I must say, and uh, that's better than having just boxes built. Um, I look forward to some great things. Um, I will work with staff as best that we can um, to try and figure out how the heck we can do this access and egress because without that being solved, we still have a problem. So I will be supporting this. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Asmussen. Thank you. Um, it's been a long time. I came out to the site, visited the site, talked to the people there about their concerns probably about two months ago or somewhere in there. And when I look at 
what's been done to this, the building and the site, some of the comments that were made to me at that meeting with these people. I think that the proponent has shown tonight that they have listened to pushing the building back as far as they can, to taking down the, that concrete wall, opening up that space there. So I think they've, they've done a lot of good things in response to what I'd heard that day that I was visiting and, and was shown their concerns there. Um, so I give them credit for being flexible and being understanding to those. I want to thank the architect. One of my little pet peeves has been around. I guess he's heard me a couple of times about wanting iconic looking buildings. And when I saw his latest rendering, which we haven't got to deep here, just doing the zoning right now, you're starting to get the idea of what I'm trying to talk about that's going to create a, a visually good looking building. And I want to thank you for stepping up on that part there. So thank you for that and I'm listening to that. Um, the lane's an issue. Um, and it, it, it needs to be solved. I do know Mr. McIntyre said at the last uh, council meeting that the two developers to the east at the corner of Clark and Coma Lake and back are have had meetings. So their possibility of getting the, the lane widened from Como Lake towards Clark up past the Beatty property. Um, if this does get approved after development permit, it's probably another two years away after that point from, you know, detailed drawings, getting in the ground before anybody's going to be living in there. So, you know, this, there won't be anybody living in that building till middle of 216, I would probably at the earliest say. So it gives us more time to work with other developers and proponents on the rest of that laneway there. I've been around a long time in Coquitlam. We've been waiting from when Mr. Sikora was mayor about SkyTrain to Coquitlam and not happening and, and not happening and always wanted to revitalize Burquitlam. It's one of the big key things for a number of years. While SkyTrain's here, the revitalization of Burquitlam is now underway. There is change happening, and, and that's difficult when change happens. But when I look at this and the proximity to this development to the SkyTrain station, it fits in the density and what we're looking for in that area. And I think it's what we've always looked for in that area. You can quibble over certain details, uh, concept drawings are just what they are. It's their concept drawings. They're not actual. And I think what we've done a lot of things to get away from those type of concepts. They give a, a misleading imp impression to people. Um, but when you look at developments that are close to sky trains, if you look at Vancouver, New Westminster, Burnaby, and you look at the amount of people with one car, giving, as the other lady said, giving up a car because you are close to the bus loop, the sky train, greater accessibility, and there's going to be a greater level of on-street shopping in that area. As you get the, the development along Clark and the safe window, you're going to have a lot more walkability, livability, walking in that area, not so much driving from those people in that area. So I'm going to move this forward, give it second and third readings. I do have some issues about the laneway that does need to be accessed. I do think the developer right now in the last drawing has done, I think, as much as they can to orient the building and to turn away the balconies to create as much of a privacy issue as you can in a high-rise. Remember, you're in a high-rise area. You're not in a suburban single family. You're in a more urban, densified area. So those are the trade-offs you have because you have the better transit. You have the better close proximity to certain things. So there's certain trade-offs. But I'm just looking at the zoning, the, the affordable, the housing for the Y is a bonus to this, but I think this fits with what we're doing there, and I think the laneway as a two-way full laneway in the future is the best way to access traffic in and out, not off Faro and off Clark Road. I think the laneway is, by the Transportation Planning Department, the, the best way to go long term. So I'll be supporting this going for second and third reading and hopefully getting those answers back on the laneway and putting that over to those brilliant minds on that side there to work with our staff to fi find out the answers to this. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Hodge. You know, this, this, is, this has been a, a, you know, it's a tough decision because I, I, you know, I, I live in a neighborhood that's undergone significant change, so I understand that how change impacts people. And I, and I look at this and I think, you know what, you know, the decision that I'm going to make tonight, you know, tonight's decisions are going to become tomorrow's realities. And so, you know, we have to sort of really think, you know, how is this going to play out into the future? And, and I think that Burquitlam is going to 
be a great community as we move forward, but it, it's a community that's in transition. Um, buildings that have been there for years are being impacted. A lot of buildings that are going to come down. This is a neighborhood that contains over 30% of our affordable housing, our rental housing, and that's going to be lost and so we have to look at how we're going to start to replace some affordable housing. I, I wish there was more but I think that this is a step in the, in the right direction. I think that's, um, this is a very creative approach. I look at the uh, proposal tonight and there's some things that really work for me. I, I like the housing component, the component because of the fact that uh, we are going to be losing affordable housing and this is, you know, in a small way is going to help to sort of start to replace that. Um, I'm happy with the parking on this one. Usually I'm complaining about the parking. I think we've got the parking right here, particularly close to a, to a SkyTrain station. Um, there are some things that don't work for me, and we've talked about it, and that's, that's the lane. That, that doesn't work for me, and it's not going to work for the community. But tonight we're here talking about um, a zoning change. Is it appropriate to have this type of a building this close to a SkyTrain station? I would argue this is the only type of um, use that we can have this close to a SkyTrain station. So the challenge becomes, how do we make it work? Uh, how do we make it work in the interim? Because this is a community that's in transition, and that's going to be the toughest part, is how do we transition between what we have today and where we're going to be tomorrow? Part of that transition is also having a, a, a new uh, neighborhood plan in place. And uh, I was really pleased tonight that the Maillardville one has moved ahead. We saw people, people came out and said, wow, I wish we had a plan like this. Well, darn it, now we're going to try and give them a plan like that. And I think that, that, as far as I'm concerned, that work for council and our staff, that starts tomorrow. I know you're already underway, but I think we get on with that plan. Uh, but in the meantime, uh, the, the neighborhood is in transition. We put the TDS in, in, in place to handle that, and, and I'm comfortable that we will be able to move forward. But as I said, I think we've got to address that, the road. Um, Councilor Asmussen, Asmussen is right. We, we don't need it tomorrow, and we probably don't need it in two years, but I'm concerned that when this building is, begins to be occupied, uh, and we're going to need better access through there. And I, and I think we're all going to have to work and come up with some creative solutions. It may involve neighboring properties. Um, I note that uh, on, the, on the plan we see other developments are going to be coming forward. Uh, at least one of them may also have to use this lane. And uh, maybe there's some opportunities to work with other properties to try to, even if it's another interim solution, I believe the, four, the two lanes right across the street at that light, that, that looks good, it makes sense. Unfortunately, that's not what we're going to have today, and that, that concerns me. Um, some of the other benefits from, from this is that with density will come some of the amenities that this community so desperately needs. Uh, hopefully, we're going to be able to get some more park space. Um, I want to see. I, I think we also need to, at some point, we're going to have to address the, the parking outside of this. I think this one's got it right, but we heard issues about parking, possibly a park and ride there. Um, I think we need, uh, you know, we're, we're talking that we may be able to get the Y in place or some sort of a recreation center. Those are things that come with increased in density. And the challenge is, is how do we get the benefits of the increase in density and still mitigate some of the negative things that are going to come along. And to me, the negative part of this is uh, the transportation in the interim. And so I really hope that before this comes back with uh, the development permit, that we by then have, maybe we see a little bit more of the picture, how things are coming together, and that we can find a creative solution to, uh, to work on that. Thank you. Councillor Zarello and Councillor Sikora are opposed. The motion carries. Item 13 is fourth, fourth and final reading of City of Coquitlam Highway Dedication Cancellation Bylaw number 4460-2014 adjacent to Lee Park. The recommendation is that Council give fourth and final reading to City of Coquitlam Highway Dedication Cancellation Bylaw number 4460-2014. Moved by Councillor Hodge, seconded by Councillor Asmundson. All in favor? Opposed? Carried unanimously. 
Last item is the Metro Vancouver Board and Brief, dated February 28th, 2014. The recommendations that Council received the Board and Brief for information. Moved by Councillor O'Neill, second by Councillor Nicholson. All in favor? Opposed? Carried unanimously. That concludes the items on this evening's agenda. So you're saying the microphones were dead, we have to do it all over again? Yes, that's okay. exactly what I'm saying. Welcome to April 1st. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Motion to adjourn from Councillor O'Neill. <laughs> Second by Councillor Asmussen. All in favor? Opposed? Carried unanimously. We don't normally have a public question period after a meeting that included a public hearing. Okay, are there any questions from the audience on tonight's agenda? Any questions at all? Any questions from the audience? Thank you all for coming.